we've had Jared Diamond speak a num number of times. I've known Jared for, for many years now. Those of you that have followed science, you know, you remember his first book, The Third Chimpanzee, in which he sort of reclassified the great apes. So there's the bonobos, chimps, and us, and uh, just sort of a different perspective on things. It's a collection of his many essays and, and commentaries in Nature and, and Discover Magazine and Natural History Magazine and so on. His book after that was Why Sex is Fun, which is, if you want to know how to title a book, that's a good title. <laughs> um, and then, of course, he, um, he really broke onto the pop cultural scene with Guns, Germs, and Steel. And, uh, and this is really where we're heading today, that is, in terms of today's talks, is understanding how a scientist can study history. Most historians write history like this. A happens, then B happens, then C happens, then D happens. And if they happen to be a good narrative storyteller, it's a good book. But what Jared does is he says A happens, then B happens, then C happens. Now, why don't we stop here for a second and ask, why did it happen that way? And what if it happened some other way in some other place, and we can compare those, that sort of thing. And that, believe it or not, that was like a shocking thing for people to hear. A scientist can actually apply hypothesis testing and, uh, to, to something that happened in the past. And uh, so that was the basis of Guns, Germs, and Steel, in which he explained the overall development of civilizations how they developed differentially around the world for thirteen last 13,000 years. And then his sequel to that collapse was what happened to those civilizations when they collapsed and why, again, using that comparative method. And then, so the new book, the one uh, that um, he's touring for now, Natural Experiments of History, uh, an edit edited volume of basically compiling lots of different ways to use this methodology to understand things that happened both in the past and why the world is the way it is today. For example, Haiti or Chile or whatever in terms of news and newsworthy events. And, uh, and so Jared's a, a, a longtime friend of skepticism and, and the supporter of good science education and he applies science to all areas of life. So we're here to hear him tell us about his methodology on natural experiments of History with that, please help me welcome Dr. Jared Diamond. Let me first check whether you'll be able to hear me okay in back. Can you hear okay? It's a pleasure to be back here talking for the Skeptic Society once again, especially on a beautiful day like this when you have alternatives. Um, I should just like to point out, however, to correct one detail in Michael's very kind introduction, and that is that I never wrote a book entitled Why Sex is Fun, <laughs> because I don't understand why sex is fun. <laughs> I did write a book entitled, Why Is Sex Fun? Question mark, <laughs> which wrestles with this difficult problem, and at the end of 167 pages concludes, we don't know, <laughs> but there are possible explanations. And Michael, as far as this being a great title um, for selling books, um, my book, Why Is Sex Fun? is actually the worst <laughs> selling. <laughs> <laughs> of my books. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the subject matter. <laughs> Today, I'd like to start with a longish fable. And this fable concerns a recent visit to planet Earth by an extraterrestrial from a planet orbiting the star Arcturus. And that extraterrestrial had double majored in history and chemistry at the University of Arcturus. Well, on arriving on Earth, the visitor learned that one of the biggest events in recent Earth history was military conquests by an Earthling named Napoleon, who turned Europe upside down for 20 years. But the Arcturian visitor was dismayed to discover that human historians we're still arguing today about the effect of Napoleon. After 200 years, historians couldn't agree on an answer to a simple question. Was Napoleon good or bad for economic development in Europe? Well, some historians gave to our visitor an a priori answer. They argued Napoleon must have been good for economic development in Europe because Napoleon swept away all those institutions such as feudalism 
and guilds and legal privileges for nobles and church people. Napoleon swept away those institutions that outdated ones that were holding back economic development. But other historians gave to our visitor the opposite a priori answer. They reasoned Napoleon must have been bad for economic development in Europe because Napoleon caused war and chaos and he destroyed institutions that, whatever their shortcomings, had still been functioning reasonably well for a long time. Then there were still other historians who did case studies. They devoted their lives to the history of some little piece of Europe during the Napoleonic era, and then they wrote nuanced monographs full of selective quotations and footnotes. If the particular area that they studied had been conquered by Napoleon and got richer, or had not been conquered by Napoleon and didn't get richer, they concluded from that case study that Napoleon was good for economic development. On the other hand, if the, if an area the, if the area that they studied had been spared by Napoleon and got richer, or had been conquered by Napoleon and did not get richer, they concluded from that case study that Napoleon was bad for economic development in Europe. Unfortunately, though, there are lots of confounding variables affecting post-Napoleonic European development besides Napoleon. So we can't generalize from a single case study. And thus, our Arcturian historian became disillusioned with earthly historians. But remember, our extraterrestrial visitor had been trained at the University of Arcturus in laboratory chemistry, double major. Our visitor knew about manipulative control experiments. You test explanations by manipulating one variable at a time, doing replicates of the manipulations, and maintaining match controls without the manipulation. For example, if you want to test whether a certain enzyme does or doesn't react with a certain substrate, a chemist fills a series of identical test tubes with the same substrate solution, and then half of those test tubes are randomly selected to have the enzyme added, while the other half of the tubes don't have the enzyme added. In addition, our visitor from Arcturus had been trained not just in laboratory chemistry and history, but he had also been trained in the use of Arcturian time machines. And so our visitor used his time machine to settle the Napoleon debate by a manipulative experiment. Namely, he used his time machine to sprinkle Napoleonic armies at random over the map of Europe in the year 1800. And he let Napoleon conquer 15 patches of Europe and not conquer 15 other patches, selected at random. Then our visitor came back 50 years later. He did this in Germany to have a tighter control experiment. Of course, each area of Germany had its own idiosyncratic features, apart from whether or not our visitor had randomly chosen it to get mushed up by Napoleon. But 50 years later, the visitor found that the Napoleonized areas were, on the average, significantly richer than the non-Napoleonized areas. Hence, conclusion from this controlled experiment, Napoleon did more good than harm for economic development. Of course, this is an imaginary story. We Earthlings cannot do manipulative retroactive experiments with a time machine. Nevertheless, something similar really did happen as a natural experiment of history. Napoleon did conquer many pieces of modern Germany while leaving other pieces of modern Germany unconquered. Napoleon chose which particular pieces of Germany to conquer for momentary geopolitical and military reasons, such as whether a particular German prince wanted to cooperate with Napoleon or not and had to be conquered, and whether some brother or cousin or in-law of Napoleon wanted to be put on the throne of that particular part of Germany. Napoleon's selection of pieces of Germany to conquer was unrelated to their economic potential in the distant future which Napoleon couldn't foresee anyway. 50 years later, it turned out that the Napoleonized areas were indeed significantly richer than the non-Napoleonized areas 
Again, the conclusion that Napoleon was, on the average, good for long-term economic development in Europe. But this natural experiment, like other natural experiments, has some obvious complications. For example, why did it take 50 years after the end of the Napoleonic year, um, wars for the Napoleonized areas to become clearly richer? Napoleon's sweeping away of outdated institutions alone wasn't enough. It took a combination of the institutional change and the Industrial Revolution, which didn't arrive in Central Europe until about 50 years after Napoleon did his things. That's to say, in those areas where Napoleon had swept away outdated institutions, when the Industrial Revolution eventually arrived, the Industrial Revolution was embraced and those areas got richer. Whereas in those parts of Europe, such as Austria and German states, not Napoleonized, where the old institutions had remained in place, when the Industrial Revolution arrived, those areas were still burdened with outdated institutions and they didn't industrialize as fast and get rich as fast. Then one can wonder, was Napoleon's selection of areas to conquer really random with respect to economic potential? Or did Napoleon somehow select areas that were already richer? We know that Napoleon's expressed motives for conquering particular pieces of Germany were military and political and dynastic, and they didn't even mention economic value. But it's also significant that the areas that Napoleon chose to conquer were on the average poorer rather than richer at the time that Napoleon started on his conquests, suggesting that it was not that he selected the economically promising areas. Then one can also wonder, could it have been the case that the significant factor in those areas becoming richer was not Napoleon's deeds themselves, but instead something that just happened to be correlated with Napoleon? For example, maybe Napoleon preferred to conquer areas of Germany that were predominantly Lutheran rather than Catholic, and maybe there's something about the Lutheran areas that made them more prone to become rich and develop economically than the Catholic areas. There are other possible correlated variables, and all you can do is to test them one by one. So for example, in this study of Europe's economic growth, one can test whether religion variation in religion explains which areas of Europe got richer, and no, religion does not explain the areas. So it's not that at least religion as a correlated variable explains the effect of Napoleon. Of course, one has to worry, was there something special about Germany? And if we broadened our canvas and looked at more of Europe, would you come to some different conclusion about Napoleon? Well, the analysis has been repeated on all of Europe, not just Germany, and the conclusion remains the same. Napoleonized areas of Europe in general ended up richer than non-Napoleonized areas. And finally, one might object with justice that Napoleon was not a single manipulation, but Napoleon was an entire vector of effects. Napoleon was associated with the end of guilds and with ending feudalism and with reforming the legal system and making nobles and commoners equal before the law and making church people and lay people equal before the law and abolishing monasteries. So there's this whole vector of Napoleonic effects acting together. This natural experiment by itself doesn't show the relative importance of those individual factors within the vector. You need more information or else more natural experiments. And I'll mention to you that there isn't, in fact, another natural experiment that helps sort out some of those factors within the vector. That then the end is the end of the longest pre preamble to a talk that I've ever given, about a 15 minute preamble. <laughs> and where this gets us is that it illustrates that in general, we think of experiment, the word experiment is meaning a manipulative controlled experiment. All you molecular biologists, physicists, and chemists here define experiment as manipulative controlled experiment. It's considered the best scientific method to test hypotheses and explanations.
it can and has been used in fields where it really is possible to manipulate your materials, such as molecular biology, chemistry, and physics. But there are other areas that everybody considers sciences where you can't use manipulative experiments because they would be immoral or illegal or impossible, or all three of those things. For example, epidemiology. Everybody considers epidemiology to be a good science. Suppose an epidemiologist were interested in identifying the basis of genetic resistance to smallpox. And suppose our epidemiologist wanted to carry out a manipulative controlled experiment. It would be simple. I would draw a line down the center of this auditorium. Everybody on this side of the line, I would inject with smallpox virus. Everybody on this side of the line, including Michael, um, I would inject with a control solution that did not contain smallpox virus. I would measure the blood groups of all of you, the injected and the controlled group, and come back three weeks later to see which of you had died and <laughs> see how that related to your blood groups. And in, within three weeks, I would know which blood groups provide genetic resistance to smallpox. Unfortunately, that controlled manipulative experiment, beloved of molecular biologists and physicists and chemists in other contexts, is considered immoral. Nevertheless, in effect, something pretty similar happened as a natural experiment. In India around 1966, one of the last smallpox epidemics of history happened to hit a remote village of India at a time when there were some physicians there doing genetic studies. They had been typing people for their blood groups. And so the physicians looked at houses where there was or wasn't someone who had a case of smallpox. And the physicians then looked at siblings and other people in the houses. They had the blood groups of all these people. And over the course of the following several weeks, they discovered who got smallpox and who haven't gotten it got seriously sick and who haven't gotten seriously sick died of it and who didn't. And the result was that people with blood group A were particularly susceptible to contracting smallpox and getting seriously sick and dying of it compared to people with blood group B or O. This was not a manipulative experiment. It was instead a natural experiment that yielded a conclusion that we could have reached, I grant you more unequivocally, if I had been permitted to do that immoral set of <laughs> injections. Also, there are many areas of evolutionary biology and ecology where one can't do manipulative experiments. Ecologists are interested in relations between species, such as whether one species can, competes with another species. There are two species of woodpeckers called sapsuckers here in Ca Southern California. There's the red-breasted sapsucker and Williamson sapsucker. And I, as an ornithologist, would like to know whether Williamson sapsucker competes with and depresses the abundance of red-breasted sapsuckers. I could get the answer pretty quickly if I were permitted to roam around with a shotgun and exterminate Williamson sapsuckers at random in a batch of patches and leave them intact in other patches and come back next year and discover the changes in population levels of red-breasted sapsuckers. Well, that experiment, manipulative experiment, would be neat and powerful, but whether or not it's immoral, it certainly is illegal. Nevertheless, one can get a similar result by a natural experiment. It happens that Williamson sapsuckers are present in some areas of habitat and absent in other areas of otherwise suitable habitat as a result of immigration extinction dynamics and population size so that one can compare the areas with and without Williamson sapsucker in this natural experiment to determine the effect of Williamson sapsucker on the population behavior of red-breasted sapsucker, even though the manipulative experiment would be illegal. Then there's astronomy and there's geology. Everybody agrees that astronomy is a science. Everybody agrees that geology is a science, even though it's impossible to manipulate planets and glaciers. Instead, you have to do natural experiments. You have to compare different actual planets and different glaciers. Or any historical science, paleontology is accepted as a science, historical geology is a science, but it's impossible to manipulate the past. Natural experiments are commonly used in 
all of those areas of science where you can't use manipulative experiments because they're immoral, illegal, impossible, or all of those. Natural experiments nevertheless pose lots of complications, just as do manipulative experiments. Neither type of experiment is an easy magic bullet. There's instead a big literature on how to overcome the complications of natural experiments, as well as how to overcome the complications of manipulative experiments. The recent book by Jim Robinson and me describes eight natural experiments to illustrate the spectrum of natural experiments. They can be classified into two types. Either you've got similar initial conditions and different perturbations, or you've got different initial conditions and similar perturbations. The experiment that I described to you about Napoleon um, is one in which the initial conditions are similar, different little pieces of Germany, but you either do have or don't have a perturbation of Napoleon. In fact, the experiment is even more interesting than that because in that natural experiment, there are three comparisons. No Napoleon. Napoleon and his institutional effects were allowed to continue after the Napoleonic Wars. When Prussia took over parts of Germany, Prussia left Napoleon's changes intact. And then the third experimental model is areas of Germany that were Napoleonized, we, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the institutional changes produced by Napoleon were reversed. It turns out that areas that Napoleon turned upside down and where his institutional changes were allowed to stay in place, those ended up richer than the areas that were Napoleonized where his institutional changes were reversed, showing that it's not the messes created by Napoleon that resulted in economic development, but it's the institutional changes. Another of our studies that involves similar initial conditions but different manipulations is a familiar, much debated question of history. It regards the African slave trade. The African slave trade was horrible and it was immoral and it was cruel, but was it bad for the economic development of modern Africa? One would like to believe that it was, but there are economic studies that show, suggest that however horrible the slave trade was, that it really did not penalize the economic development of modern Africa. So how can we sort this out by a natural experiment? It turns out that one can compare the 52 countries of Africa 150 years after the end of the slave trade. Of those 52 countries, some were sources for the slave trade and some were not. It's an even richer experiment. There was not one slave trade in Africa, but there were at least four different slave trades across the Red Sea, across the Indian Ocean, across the Sahara, and across the Atlantic. It turns out from this natural experiment that today, 150 years after the end of the slave trade, the countries of Africa that used to be sources of the slave trade are on the average poorer than those that were not sources of the slave trade, indicating that the slave trade was not just horrible, but that it produced long-lasting negative economic effects. Then there's another example of a natural experiment that looks at similar initial conditions but different manipulations. And this is another one of those debated, long-standing questions of history. Was the British colonization of India good or bad for India? This is a question about which my British friends and my Indian friends tend to have different perspectives. <laughs> my British friends are inclined to say that, well, really, the British colonization of India was good for India because it democratized India and it unified India and da 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 da. Whereas my Indian friends tend to say, well, on the average, the British colonization of India was bad for India because the British did lots of things that were good for Britain's economy but bad for the Indian economy, such as suppressing the native Indian textile um, industry, et cetera, et cetera. How can one settle this question by a natural experiment? Well, one can compare 233 different areas of India 
where the British used different methods of tax collection. The British either left in place the original Indian tax collectors, or else they appointed new tax collectors operating on British models. And which solution they used depended upon who was the viceroy in India at a particular time and what was going on in Britain at the time that that particular area of India got added to the British realm. It's now 59 years, it's now more than that, it's 62 years after the end of British rule in India. And today, 62 years after the British tax collection system became homogenized, it turns out that the formerly unmodified areas that retained Indian tax collectors have more paved roads, more secondary schools, more primary schools, and more electricity on the average than the areas where the British introduced their own system of tax collection, indicating that at least as far as tax collection was concerned, the British administration of India had negative effects that persisted. Then another experiment involving very similar initial conditions but different manipulations is one that has been on the headlines for the last month or so. Any of you who've taken the airplane flight from Miami or Houston to Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic, will have flown over perhaps the most amazing political border in the world. The island of Hispaniola got divided through accidents of colonial history between two countries, Haiti in the west and the Dominican Republic in the east. And any of you who've taken that plane flight will have looked down and seen that amazing border. It's as if the island was cut by a sharp knife. On the west side of the border, it's brown. That's Haiti, more than 99% deforested with massive soil erosion. On the east side of the border, it's green. That's the Dominican Republic, whose pine forests start 30 yards from the border. The Dominican Republic, more than 34% forested today. Haiti, the poorest country in the New World, the Dominican Republic, seven times richer than Haiti on a per capita basis, as a result of taking one island, fairly uniform island, and through an accident of colonial history, namely the Spanish setting up their capital in the east, so the French pirates set up their bases in the west, and Haiti became a French colony, the Dominican Republic became a Spanish colony, but France was rich and Spain was more interested in Peru and Mexico. So the France massively imported slaves, the Spanish did not. The slaves in the French part developed a distinct language, Haitian Creole, the Eastern part, the Dominican part still spoke Spanish. The ships that brought the slaves to Haiti carried out timber, so the Haitian part got deforested, the Dominican part much less so. And once the slaves achieved independence in a very bloody war, naturally the last thing they wanted was Europeans coming back to enslave them again, whereas conversely Europeans and Americans did not want to see an ex-slave colony succeed. So it took more than 100 years, but Haiti, which was initially much richer than the Dominican Republic, gradually ran downhill while the Dominican Republic was going uphill to the point where today the Dominican Republic has a per capita income more than six times that of Haiti and about 33 times more TV sets and eight times more doctors. It's a natural experiment of history and accident of colonial history. Those then are four types of natural experiments which share similar initial conditions but different perturbations either a perturbation versus no perturbation, Napoleon versus no Napoleon, or one type of perturbation versus a different type of perturbation, French colonization versus Spanish colonization. The other type of natural experiment um, is one in which you've got similar manipulations but different initial conditions. For example, there are hundreds of Pacific islands that got colonized by Polynesians. Same perturbation. Polynesian colonization, but those Pacific islands differed in their initial conditions. They differed physically. Some Pacific islands are big, some are small, some are remote, some are close to other islands, some are low, others are high, some are wet, others are dry, some are old, others are young, some are near the equator and hot, 
Others are far from the equator and seasonally cold. Some have and others don't receive volcanic ash, increasing soil fertility. Some do and others don't receive Asian dust to increase soil fertility. And then some do and others don't have a type of terrain called Makatea that's difficult to walk around in. But all of them, despite those different initial conditions, got perturbed by Polynesians. We can now look a thousand years later at the effects of this same perturbation on different initial conditions. For example, Polynesian societies ended up varied in their socio-political complexity. Some Polynesian societies ended up as kingdoms or virtual states or empires. Others ended up with really weak village level chiefs. It turns out that a comparison of three, a natural experiment with n equals three, suggests that socio-political complexity is related to initial conditions, namely socio-political complexity is highest for big productive Polynesian islands like Hawaii and Tonga. A more extensive natural experiment in Polynesia is to compare 81 different islands for their deforestation. Some Polynesian islands like Easter Island ended up massively or totally deforested. Others ended up barely deforested. If you take this natural experiment of looking at 81 different Polynesian islands, the degree of deforestation turns out to vary with the initial conditions. Deforestation is most severe on islands that are cold or dry or low or remote or small or old or that had no Makatea or that received little volcanic ash or that received little Asian dust. All of those things funnel into the variable of low tree regrowth rates, which means high deforestation when you start to chop down trees. Parenthetically, this explains why among Pacific Islands, Easter Island is notorious for having suffered the most extreme deforestation with the extermination of its native forest. By those nine variables of those initial conditions, it's not that the Polynesians on Easter Island were particularly thoughtless. It's that they had the misfortune to inherit the island with the most fragile initial conditions. Easter Island is relatively cold and it's dry and it's low and it's remote and small and old, et cetera, et cetera. Still another natural experiment that involves a similar perturbation but different initial conditions is the injection of independent banking systems into New World colonies. The colonial powers that ran the New World, France, Spain, Britain, tended not to want to set up independent banks in their colonies. They wanted to control the banking system back in Europe. And so when the colonies achieved independence, they faced a similar perturbation, a similar need, namely the need to develop an independent banking system. But the initial conditions were quite different in the United States and Mexico and Brazil. And as a result, this common perturbation, the need to develop independent banking systems, under these different initial conditions resulted in different banking systems and different economic growth in the United States, Mexico, and Brazil. And then finally, a perturbation, similar perturbation with different initial conditions is one that addresses one of the main themes in American history, namely the influence of the frontier. Uh, there has been much discussion among historians about the role of the frontier in American history in establishing democratic institutions, et cetera, et cetera. But the United States is not the only country that had a rolling frontier. Yes, the United States did have a frontier of European settlement and growth of the frontier, but that was also true. There was also a frontier in Canada and a frontier in Australia and a frontier in New Zealand, a frontier in South Africa, those were all British frontiers, but there was a Spanish-Italian frontier in Argentina, and there was a Russian frontier in Siberia. So here are all these different initial conditions, either British or Spanish or Russian society, and they all get the same perturbation of a European expanding frontier, but they get that perturbation with different peoples, British, 
Spanish, Italian, or Russian, and they get it at different times, either, be, either early in the Industrial Revolution or late in the Industrial Revolution. It turns out that all seven of these frontiers went through similar economic cycles of what's called boom, bust, and export stimulation. That's to say, all of these frontiers went through an economic boom driven by imports, which then crashed and then led to, ex to export rescue when the frontier finally began exporting stuff such as wheat uh, back to the metropolises. So up till now, I've, my experiments have mostly revealed divergences, divergence between Napoleonized and non-Napoleonized areas. But here's an experiment that reveals a convergence despite very different initial conditions, whether the frontier was Russian or British, and whether the frontier had its explosion early or late in the Industrial Revolution, all seven of these frontiers nevertheless went through a similar boom-bust rescue cycle, suggesting that there's something about the sheer dynamics of frontiers, the demographic and economic dynamics of frontiers, that override these differences in initial conditions. With natural experiments, any natural experiments, there are recurrent problems that you have to pay attention to. And they're illustrated by Napoleon, but they apply to other natural experiments. With any natural experiment, you have to ask, was the selection of the perturbed areas really random with respect to the variable of interest? I mentioned, for example, were Napoleonic conquests random with respect to long-term economic potential? In the case of Napoleon, you can satisfy yourself that the answer was yes. You have to ask that question with any natural experiment. You always have to worry whether, in a natural experiment, the explanation might not be the manipulation that you focused on, but something correlated with it. In the case of Napoleon, one had to test whether the explanation was really, say, religion rather than Napoleon. In the case of deforestation in Polynesia, my colleague Barry Roulette and I were concerned that maybe the explanation was not the different physical conditions of the islands, but different agricultural practices of Polynesians, because some Polynesians had irrigation agriculture, and some, some had dry land agriculture, and some had tree arboriculture. So maybe that, rather than the physical conditions of the islands, explained the different degree of deforestation. And we spent two years analyzing the different agricultural practices of Polynesians. And at the end of two years, we concluded no agricultural practices did not explain the outcome. We were left with the physical variables as the outcome. But it's something that you had to test as a possible correlated variable. Still another common problem with natural experiments is that the outcome may be something that's difficult to quantify. For example, I have a historian friend who studies the media and television in modern Japan. And when I discussed natural experiments with him, he said, you can't quantify television in modern Japan. Well, whether or not you can quantify it, at least, though, you can rank it. And that's a similar phenomenon in other areas of science. There are some things hard to quantify, but you can rank as no effect, a little effect, a big effect, or a massive effect. When Barry Roulette and I were analyzing deforestation in Polynesia, there was no way that we could say this island was 77% deforested and that island 23%, but at least we could say whether the island was not deforested at all, a little deforested, moderately, severely, or totally deforested. And there are areas of statistics that specifically analyze variables that you can rank and not quantify. Then, in a natural experiment, the outcome may not be immediate. It may take some time to develop. In the case of Napoleon, Napoleon shaking up Europe took 50 years to make the parts of Europe that Napoleon shook up richer. In the case of the Haiti-Dominican Republic experiment, so the French were thrown out of Haiti around 1804, and shortly after the Dominican Republic became, after that, the Dominican Republic became independent. Initially, at the time of independence, Haiti was far richer and more powerful than the Dominican Republic. And yet, Haiti had those long-term factors tending to make Haiti poorer. But it, was, it took between 100 and 130 years for the Dominican Republic to overtake Haiti. Big lag between the effects of the initial conditions and the outcome. In natural experiments, one 
commonly has to worry about the possibility of reverse causation. That's to say you apply a perturbation, or, or you look at a natural perturbation, and you think, ah, oh, A caused B, but maybe it was reverse causation. Maybe instead B caused A. How can you figure that out? Sometimes you can figure it out from time relations. For example, in Polynesia, volcanic ash fallout is associated with rapid tree growth and low deforestation. Is it that volcanic ash fallout causes high tree growth, or is it that rapid tree growth causes volcanic ash fallout? In this case, we happen to know mechanistically the tree growth does not cause volcanic ash fallout, but volcanic ash does cause tree growth. But even if we didn't know that, we could nevertheless look at the time sequence, and we could see first the volcano drops ash, and then the trees grow. So the time, re time, time relations may help you figure out issues of reverse causation. And then yet another problem in natural experiments is that, of course, the more noise you've got, that's to say the more numerous are the independent variables, the more cases you need to establish outcomes, to establish effects. But conversely, the more cases you've got, the more independent variables you'll be able to assess their effect. And so in the case of Polynesia, Barry Roulette and I had 81 Polynesian islands, and 81 islands proved to be sufficient to establish significantly statistically significant effects of nine different variables on deforestation. In short, then, natural experiments are a widespread method in the social sciences. In fields concerned with human history, natural experiments are almost routine today in anthropology, archaeology, economics, economic history, political science, and sociology. Surprisingly, Natural experiments are not widespread among historians themselves, except among economic historians who are a distinctive breed. In fact, his, seriously, histor my historian friends tell me that. Um, historians tend to be skeptical or hostile towards natural experiments, and that's paradoxical. But there are at least four groups of reasons that I hear from my historian friends about why they don't use or don't like natural experiments on the average, with some exceptions. One is that historians tend to consider themselves humanists and storytellers rather than as scientists. Um, I remember I've frequently visited Duke University where one of my sons just graduated, so I've talked a lot with historians at Duke. I learned that at Duke, the undergraduate college places the history department within the social sciences, but the graduate school at Duke places the history department within the humanities. This illustrates the split identity of historians. Historians frequently say the methods of the social sciences are inappropriate to human history. Students, undergraduates who want to study human history and decide whether or not to enroll in a graduate program in history or political science or sociology, they frequently choose to enter graduate school in history, partly to avoid having to learn statistics, quantitative methods, and <laughs> scientific methods. For example, my university, UCLA, I understand that our history department has a statistics course, but I also understand that it's not required, and that relatively few of our graduate students choose to take this statistics course. So that's part of the reason for the hostility towards natural experiments and something that often usually requires statistics to evaluate. A second reason, or a set of reasons for historian skepticism or hostility is the tradition within history of devoting one's career to a small geographic area and a small slice of time, such as 19th century French history or the American Civil War. Just read the job ads at in history journals or at history meetings. The job ads specify, we want a 19th century French historian, or we want a modern American historian. If then you devote your whole career to studying the American Civil War, and at the end of 40 years, you feel you're finally starting to get some intuitive sense of the American Civil War, 
you wouldn't dare write a paper on the Spanish Civil War to which you know you didn't devote your life, but conversely you resent it if a Spanish Civil War historian would have the temerity to write about the American Civil War. The reality is that you cannot understand the American Civil War without understanding why it differed from the Finnish Civil War and the Spanish Civil War and the Russian Civil War and the Japanese Civil War and the Chinese Civil War. At the end of the American Civil War, the victors did not kill the defeated. At the end of the Spanish Civil War, the victors killed hundreds of thousands of the defeated. Why this difference between the American and the Spanish Civil War? There were generalities about civil wars, and there were also differences between civil wars. You cannot claim that you understand the American Civil War unless you understand what it shares in common with other civil wars and how it differs from other civil wars. What this illustrates is that in, in any science, there's a tension between individual case studies and broad syntheses. And in mature sciences, that tension gradually becomes resolved. And it becomes understood that, of course, you need the individual case studies. Without valid case studies, there's nothing to generalize. But conversely, you need generalizations because without generalizations, there's no context into which to place the individual case studies. For example, do chemists today argue about whether it's more important to understand the periodic table or to understand the hyperfine structure of the molybdenum atom? It might be that 200 years ago, um, or 150 years ago, students of molybdenum were mocking at Mendeleev as coming up with this superficial generality. And conversely, Mendeleev was perhaps mocking that student of molybdenum who was devoting the entirety of his, his, his life to molybdenum. But chemists gradually realized that you can't construct the periodic table without having valid information about each one of those atoms. And conversely, you can't understand molybdenum or any other atom without understanding where it fits into the periodic table. So chemists today do not argue about the value of syntheses versus individual case studies. Similarly, in one of my own fields of ecology, 40 years ago, ornithology, there was a lot of tension between the students of individual bird species and the synthesizers. People who studied Williamson sapsucker um, loathed, feared, hated the generalizations produced by people like Robert McCarver, which they regarded as superficial. And they said, the only way to make progress is to immerse yourself in Williamson sapsucker. Whereas conversely, people who came up with generalizations in ecology said, a paper on Williamson sapsucker is like a paper saying this bird does this and that bird does that. You can't understand Williamson sapsucker until you can place it in a broader context. But conversely, you can't have general theories of ecology without valid studies of Williamson sapsucker and red-breasted sapsuckers and downy woodpeckers, et cetera. So over the last course of the last 40 years, this tension within ecology between synthesis and individual case studies has gradually become more comfortable. Among all the fields in which I've worked, this tension between individual studies, case studies, and synthesis is more extreme in history than in any other discipline. That's to say, historians still tend to be devoted to individual case studies and to bristle or be uncomfortable at syntheses. The next last reason why American historians in particular are suspicious of natural experiments is that American historians feel burned by one particular school of quantitative history that was at its peak several decades ago called cliometrics in the days of punch cards and mainframe computers, which were associated with their own difficulties. And historians today tend to react to suggestions that they use statistics and quantitative methods by saying, the cliometricians already tried that sort of thing, and we know it didn't work. Finally, historians will often object that human history is uniquely complicated and that you can't measure human motives or express them in numbers. But chimpanzees and solar systems are also uniquely complicated, but primatologists and astronomers have figured out how to measure and describe the properties and behavior of solar systems and chimpanzees and to express them in numbers. And psychologists and biographers have figured out ways of measuring 
the motives of living and dead humans. In short, um, it seems to me that it's perfectly possible to apply natural experiments to human history as to other historical disciplines. And the fact is that there are other disciplines that study basically historical questions and use natural experiments. Sociologists, economists, economic historians, political scientists, anthropologists, archaeologists, lots of what they do is to study problems of human history. They study many of the same problems that historians study. They study it with a wider repertoire of methods than historians adopt. And so what I, what I think has been going on in recent decades, is, and historians are sensitive about this themselves, is a progressive encroachment of people from other disciplines, sociologists, economists, et cetera, on the traditional subject matter of human history. What remains to be seen is that historians start off with wonderful training in certain areas. There's no reason they have to give up that training in the, the proper use of archives, but they could profit by adding training in natural experiments, training already shared by people who study the same phenomena of human history, but identify themselves not as historians, but as sociologists. That's all that I would like to say about natural experiments. And Wow, you've done it again. Nicely done, Jared. And not a single PowerPoint slide. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> yeah. So we will take your questions. You can come up to the uh, microphones here so we can, uh, we can hear your questions clearly. And uh, we'll just go uh, back and forth, left and right. Uh, so come on up and, uh, uh, and uh, I will call on you. And then, uh, yes, Tom McDonough. Hi. Thank you for a fascinating talk and a, a wonderful way of looking at the world that bypasses some of the emotional and political biases that people have. Uh, in the case of Hispaniola, could you explain in a little bit more detail why it is that one side developed so much better than the other? Yeah. Um, briefly, because there are books on the subject, uh, briefly, there's a slight environmental difference, namely the western side, the Haitian side, the rains come from the east. So the western side is slightly drier and slightly steeper and has less deep soil than the eastern side, but those environmental differences are a minor part of it. The big part of it is the differences in colonial history, namely France acquired the west, Spain acquired the east because of the accident of where the, the Spanish put their capital, resulting in the French pirates going to the other side of the island. And in the 1700s, France was rich and Spain was poorer, and Spain as a colonial power had more promising colonies. Peru and Mexico were very, were, were, were very productive for Spain. And so the French in, invested massively in bringing slaves into their half that became Haiti. The Spanish did not invest massively. The Haitian part developed plantation agriculture and 85% slave population. The slaves ended up developing their own language, Creole. The Spanish part ended up speaking Spanish. There were not lots of slaves. There was not plantation agriculture. And then following independence, once the, the Haitian slaves had thrown off the French in a bloody revolution, the last thing that the slaves wanted was to let those Europeans come back and enslave them. But conversely, France and the United States did not want to see some ex-slaves succeed. So Haitians themselves were resistant to European immigration and investment. Conversely, Europeans themselves were less interested in immigrating to Haiti, where the language was, was Creole, whereas in the Spanish half, the Dominicans were receptive to European immigration and investment, and they spoke Spanish there anyway. So gradually, over the course of 100 years, Haiti declined economically and the Dominican Republic rose. Those differences were reinforced by two horrible dictators, but with different economic policies in the 1930s and 1940s. So that, that is a short summary of one chapter of our book in which you can read more about it. Thank you. <laughs> over here. 
Yes, Steve Coles from UCLA. Uh, I know you've written on the topic of why Columbus discovered America and the Aztecs did not discover Europe. Uh, but one of the things that has always puzzled me is when Columbus arrived on the various islands on his multiple journeys to the New World, there were no maps by the native savage Indians to tell him, oh, just a little bit further and you'll hit Mexico. He never hit Mexico or anywhere in North America. Why, were there, why did Native Americans whom Columbus encountered in the Bahamas and elsewhere, why did they not have maps? Not only did they have, not have maps, but writing was restricted in the New World. Um, writing in the New World was confined to the most developed writing was that of the Maya in the Yucatan Peninsula and adjacent areas. And there was also writing systems in the Valley of Mexico. But the most advanced state of the New World, the Inca Empire, did not have writing. Why was there not writing in the New World when there was in the Old World? Um, there you can rush out and buy my book, Gun, Germs, and Seal. But briefly, um, it's, uh, it's that to have writing. Writing has evolved only three times in world history independently. China, Mexico, and the Fertile Crescent. And writing arises in the context of emerging states. But states arose in the old world about 2,500 years before they arose in the new world. Um, and so eventually, the Incas would have ended up with writing, but Europeans just had had writing and maps much longer than Native Americans. Over here. Hi, um, Maury Beck. Um, you describe two different kinds of experiments, natural experiments, with similar initial conditions or different initial conditions. Unfortunately, um, you give like Germany as an example, where the initial conditions were similar, supposedly, but they're really not similar. Um, and of course, you can control for that with various variables that, like you said, religion. Uh, unfortunately, there's always other variables that you don't control for, that you don't even think of, in fact, and so you have an underspecified model. And yes, that's true. Right. And then there's also indirect interactions and these sorts of things that are really difficult to test for that we do in ecology all the time. Um, now, we manage to do it, but you quickly uh, can run afoul of degrees of freedom and all that sort of stuff. I just. Right, yeah. Um, th those are um, ubiquitous problems in in natural experiments. You have to be concerned about other variables. Um, you have to be concerned about variables you haven't thought of. And so all of these books discussing how to do natural experiments, uh, they, they wrestle with how to deal with these problems. Um, ways to deal with these problems include that if you think of some other variable, you test it. Um, if you haven't thought of some other variables, someday somebody's going to think about it and you test it then. If there are a batch of variables other than the one that you initially focused on, what can you do? You can do multiple regression analyses to see <coughs> which variable masquerades for the effects of other variables. You can do things like f-test to see how much explained variance is left and whether your identified variable really is significant or whether it's acting just as a random variable. So in fact, much of the literature on natural experiments wrestles with these problems. But this is not to say that only natural experiments have their problems. Manipulative experiments also have their own problems. And, and any of you who've done either sort of experiment know that no experiment is an easy magic bullet. That response just gave me a new question. Uh, <laughs> then what is the role of predictability? Do you take your extrapolations from history and say, now we can expect this in a similar or current situation? What's, what's the role of predictability? Um, if, with a natural experiment, as with a manipulative experiment, um, if you discover some widespread effect in the social sciences, um, then just as in the physical or biological sciences, you say, given those variables, you're likely to end up with the following result. Um, a difference is that the social sciences, by definition, are concerned with people, whereas chemistry is not concerned with people. Um, Benzene molecules do not have the choice of whether to react or not. Whereas people living on an island that is cold and dry and low know that they're living on an island that is prone to deforestation. And they have the choice of whether they're going to do things realizing that they have to work harder, like Avis, 
Uh, are they going to have to do things more to make sure that they don't end up being deforested than some island that is high and warm and wet? So the social sciences can guide you in policy by warning you what's likely to happen if you don't take care. Over here. I want to, I want to come back to the, um, to the issue of, of motivation and especially state policy as a factor of history. Coming back to the, um, the, the instance of Haiti, what gets dropped from your narrative is the fact that the uh, French imposed massive reparations on Haiti, supposedly as a recompense for the loss of, of slaves. And the United States uh, quarantined Haiti for 60 years. And in more recent history, the United States um, has, has um, a military interest in controlling the straits between, between Hispaniola and, and Cuba, and also an economic policy engineered by the United States has imposed sweatshop conditions on the island of Haiti. That's, that's all a matter of, of, of human motive and, and state policy. How do you, how do you, how do you bring true. that into your equation? Yeah, that's true. And again, if you will rush out and buy my book, you will discover more things about <laughs> Haiti than I was able to pack into, into um, one minute on Haiti. It is true that, that the French imposed reparations on incredibly reparations on Haiti for taking away their slave plantations. And Haiti was paying reparation for something like 80 years after the French left. It is true that the United States has intervened militarily in Haiti. The United States has also intervened militarily in the Dominican Republic. And it happened that the evil dictator of the Dominican Republic, Trujillo, became dictator because he was trained by the Americans to be head of the Dominican police force. And he was an effective head of the police force and then parlayed that into becoming dictator of the Dominican Republic in the 1930s. So this is part of this story that what happened in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, um, a piece of that is how the outside world reacted towards Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The outside world reacted differently towards Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Over here. Thank you for your talk, Professor. I, not being very well versed in science, I hope you will help me understand a little bit more of the meaning of the term of natural experiment. And using the two examples you used, um, the slave trade in Africa and the invasion by Napoleon in Europe, I wondered why we stopped there. In other words, would we be able to use your definition and your understanding to look at, let's say, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and other events closer to us historically in time? And would it be fair under your analysis to ask hypothetically, is Japan economically better off as a result of having the atom bomb, you know, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or other questions similar to that in World War II. One can ask any question. Some questions are more difficult to answer than others, and some questions it may not be possible to answer with present techniques, and some questions it may never be possible to answer. But there are, there are certainly contemporary questions that one can ask. For example, my co-author, my co-editor, Jim Robinson, um, his previous book was a very nice comparative study of democracy in the modern world. So democracy, it means lots of things. Democracy in Singapore is not the same as democracy in the United States, and it's not the same as democracy in South Africa. So this, this wonderful book by Jim Robinson and Deron Asimoglu looks at democracy in half a dozen countries around the modern world and asks, what are the prerequisites for the functioning of so-called democracy? What are the differences in how democracy plays out in these different places? And then if you have some, some particular country, say you want to promote democracy in Zambia, what model of democracy is going to work best in Zambia? Maybe you can learn something about that by looking at these natural experiments of recent history. We'll just do one on each side more here and there. Uh, there has been much talk recently, particularly in California, of the long-term effects of Prop 13 and other such legislation. I was wondering if anybody has applied or you're intending to apply your methods 
to looking at various schemes of taxation and whether they are beneficial or not and how long it takes for that benefit to affect. There is an opportunity for a wonderful natural experiment of history, which is in fact being carried out. The American federal system gives us 50 states. And those 50 states have very different policies of taxation. Some states have income taxes and some don't. Some states have frozen property taxes, grandfather property taxes, as so California. Some states do not. And an area of political science and economics is to look around the 50 states as 50 natural experiments and see what are the consequences of having sales tax, having a low sales tax, having income tax, having low income tax, having grandfathered property taxes or not. Yes, this is an active area of political science. I want to go on the natural experiment where they have no taxes. That sounds really good, <laughs> <laughs> at least temporarily. Tim. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on the similarities and uh, differences in uh, uh, the, uh, the effect of the frontier on uh, the United States and Russia. Similarities and differences on the effects of the frontier, of the frontiers in the United States, Canada, or Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Russia, and Argentina. Some of the differences have to do with when those frontiers unfolded. The American frontier was largely closed by around 1880. The Argentinian frontier underwent its biggest expansion around 1880. The Argentinian frontier then exploded late in the Industrial Revolution. The American frontier exploded at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The frontiers also had Different, different policies or different choices by the immigrants. So the American frontier, lots of people immigrated to the United States from Europe. The immigrants from the United States, the immigrants to the United States, to the frontier, tended to stay in the United States. Of the immigrants from Spain to Argentina, something like half went home. That's a big difference. And then there are the differences in the languages and the political institutions between the the differences between Russia and Argentina and Australia and their political institutions. Overriding all these differences, though, is the common effect that the Russian frontier and the Argentine frontier and Australia and the American frontier all underwent these booms, initial booms, and the booms were all triggered by money flowing in to feed the growth of the frontier, an import boom, and then there was a crash in all these frontiers. Many of these countries, the United States, Canada, Australia, had several consecutive boom, bus, booms and then busts. And then there would be a regrowth of the frontier, but this time fueled by exports from the frontier rather than imports into the frontier. So yes, there are big differences between these frontiers. And despite the differences, there are commonalities. And that's what an evolutionary biologist calls convergent evolution.